I want us to pray before we hear the, the word of God this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to sit under your word and as we pray every week, that as your word come now to us, that we will be transformed, that we will be changed to become more like Jesus Christ. Father, bless your word. May it never come back to you empty, but carry out what pleases your heart. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, way, way back on the 26th of July, <clears throat> six Sundays ago, we started um, a series of messages with the topic, You Are In an Invisible War. And the key scripture back then was, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We started this um, series of messages knowing that though we are humans, what we actually face daily is not origins. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't fight against the flesh. There are three enemies that come against us on a daily basis. And these are the devil that comes against us. First Peter 5, 8 says that there is a roaring lion, Satan, that roams around looking for somebody to devour. And then there's the devil. We see the devil challenging Jesus when he took him to the highest point and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and its glory and said, if you bow down to me, I will give you all of this. The world is still offering us the same as it did with Jesus. And then the third enemy is the flesh. And this flesh is our sinful, fallen nature within us. This is what we had before we became Christians. And they are still within us. <clears throat> In fact, will be within us until we finish in this world and move on to be with the Lord. The biggest of them all, of course, is the flesh. And we have been focusing on the flesh for yeah six weeks now. The flesh manifests itself in self-destructive habits. And I think I've mentioned this before that psychologists would say that these seven habits are perhaps the most common ones in human beings, in all of us. Those are shame, uncontrolled thoughts, compulsions, fear, hopelessness, bitterness, insecurity. Those are the manifestations of the flesh. And they come to haunt us, they imprison us. And we ask ourselves, how can we deal with this? The answer is, of course, God's Word. It is always exciting to sit under the Word of God because Jesus said in John seventeen seventeen. As he was praying, he was actually praying for you and I. He was praying for all believers of all ages. Father, sanctify them by your truth. And then he defined what his truth is. Your word is truth. His word is Bible. And so we find the answers to all the seven self-destructive habits from the word of God. And we have been using now Romans 8, which is the greatest chapter in the whole Bible. It's almost like the gospel in a, a miniature version, verses 1 to, all the way to 39. We look at the answer to shame or the biblical habit to replace shame. It came from verse 1 of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The answer to shame is that we are no longer condemned. There is no need to walk around with a head hang low, full of guilt and shame, because Jesus took all the sins 
your sins and my sins, past, present and future, which is where shame comes from, when we make mistakes and we are shameful of them. Jesus took all of those sins, forgave them on the cross. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the answer to shame. The answer to shame is not condemned. No, not at all. The answer to uncontrolled thoughts came from uh, Romans 8 verses uh, 5 to 8, but we specifically highlighted verse 6, where it says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Uncontrolled thoughts come to us from past experiences. They haunt us. They drag us down. They cause our feelings and emotions to fly everywhere. That verse says there are two mindsets. The one from the flesh leads to death, and the ones, and the ones from the Holy Spirit, they lead to life and peace. So the answer to uncontrolled thoughts is to ask the Holy Spirit. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Holy Spirit, give me your thoughts. Give me better thoughts. That's the answer to uncontrolled thought. The answer to compulsions is to realize that because now the Spirit of God is within us, the Bible says that this Spirit of God has power. We have a new ability through the Holy Spirit to say no to compulsions. The key verse that we looked at was verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you are a Christian, if you are a born-again believer, that verse says that the Holy Spirit lives within you, and He lives within you 24-7. Remember what we said when we did a series about body, mind, and spirit? That the Spirit within you, the born-again Spirit within you, is with you forever? That is the same spirit you're going to take with you to eternity when you die. It will not improve. It's the same spirit. While well, that spirit has got the Holy Spirit living in it. I have a new ability to say no to compulsions. Because that spirit of God empowers you. That's the answer to compulsions. What about fear? The answer to fear is to turn my thoughts to God whenever I'm afraid. And we look at the key verse was from uh, 15 where it says that God does not give us the spirit of fear. It does not give us that spirit of bondage, but he gives us the adoption, the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, we look to our Father when fear knocks on the door. So shame, no condemnation, uncontrolled thoughts, Holy Spirit, give me your thoughts, compulsions, say no, because the power of the Holy Spirit is there with you, and fear, you talk to your Heavenly Father. Hopelessness we looked at last week. What is the cure for that? The biblical habits to replace hopelessness is to think long term, not short term. We look at that scripture where it talks about we will possess the blessings that God has in store for us. We will possess also the blessings that Jesus Christ has for us. And that when you focus on eternity all the way when you die and you stand with Jesus, we said last week that Jesus is like an announcement in a big show where it says, and the star of the day is Jesus Christ, and the co-star is your name. And when you focus on long term, all the way to eternity and back, it gives you the power, it gives you the strength to realize, God, my Jesus whom I can see in my mind's eyes, in my spirit's eyes, in eternity, already lives within me. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
I can already taste today what eternity will look like, will feel like, the experience of what is still to come. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you can look all the way to the end and come back where you are and you realize that what the devil throws at you, the world and even the flesh, they are tiny, tiny compared to what God has supplied for you and I. And that brings us to the sixth um, habit, biblical habit to replace bitterness. What do we do with bitterness? Well, I said in the bulletin that sin broke everything. When sin entered this world, it literally broke everything. And that's what the essence of Romans 8, 19, 25 talks about. People are broke. The weather is broke. Relationships are broke. Finances are broke. Our bodies are broke. Everything is broken. That's what those verses talk about. And living in a broken world, the result of living in a broken world is pain. And the result of pain is bitterness. Let me say that again. Living in a broken world results in pain. And the result of pain is bitterness. And it comes across in thoughts like you look at somebody else's house and say, gosh, he's got a nice house. He's got a nice car. Why aren't our children like their children? You start to compare. Bottom line, you think to yourself, life is not fair. Why do they have better things than, than us? And then you become bitter. You see, the world is broken. And everything is broken. You know what the writer of Ecclesiastes says in Chapter 1, verse 9. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Bitterness has been around since Adam was a boy. We are born into a world of bitterness. Of course, I want us to turn to God's word this morning to see what it is the answer to bitterness. Remember what I said, that the world is broken. Look at these verses from Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself was also being delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Let me carry on to the, to the next verses, 22 to 25. For we know that the whole creation groans with labors, with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves, equally waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we equally wait for it with perseverance. Do you know what those verses are saying creation is moaning we are moaning we are groaning should I say creation is groaning we are groaning everything is groaning waiting for the redemption have you noticed that that was us that caused the problem in the first place man sinned and then poor creation was thrown into it that's what those verses are saying with the hope that when we are redeemed, that creation itself will also be redeemed. And as a result of that, 
when God created everything, everything was balanced. Adam and Eve were walking around very happy and the animals with them and so forth. There was no disharmony, there was no bitterness, there was no anger. But after sin entered the world, they had to kill some animals. And as far as we know from that point onwards, animals killed animals. We killed animals and so forth. It broke everything, relationships and all. But this is what I want to say to you this morning. Though pain is in the world, bitterness is in the world, I want to say that pain is part and parcel of this world, but misery is not. Pain is not optional. Misery is. Suffering is not optional. Bitterness is. Pain and suffering are not optional. Moaning and bitterness are. You see, they do come to us pain and suffering, but it's your choice. It's what you do with it that makes the difference. Creation was subjected to frustration. Creation has been groaning in pains. We ourselves groan inwardly. Have you ever um, done this to yourself? You say, oh man, this is hard. That's growing inwardly. That's what those verses are talking about. Because sin has broken everything. And I said in the bulletin that there are four truths that we need to learn from the Word of God in order to overcome bitterness. Because bitterness, if you don't address it, will eat you up. A lot of people die from diseases that are caused by bitterness. It eats you from inside out. And here are the truths I want us to learn that we heard April read this morning. Verses 26 and 27 of Romans 8. Listen to these verses. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit makes himself, uh, makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, isn't it amazing? The first truth I want you to know of how to combat, on how to overcome bitterness is this. Know that the Holy Spirit is praying for you. The first truth is the Holy Spirit is praying for me. The Holy Spirit is praying for me. Have you noticed that God was actually talking to himself? The Holy Spirit is praying. What's he talking about? He's talking about you and I. It says that he groans with words that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit is praying for me. When bitterness settles in and when you're trying to compare and envy starts to grab hold of your heart and you say, life is not fair. Remember, your God is actually praying for you. He knows all your needs. Matthew 6, from 24 to 34, it covers the whole area of our needs and that your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you even pray. He's praying for you. Number two, truth number two, you need to know when bitterness knocks on the door. God is using everything for good in my life. I'll say that again. God is using everything for good in my life. Not, I'm not saying that everything is good. No. Not everything is good. Because remember, everything is broken. But God is using everything for good in my life. We see that from Romans 8, 28. 
and it reads, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Did you hear that? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God according to His purpose, who are called according to His purpose. What that says to me is that God is far greater than our problems. Yeah. God is greater than our enemies, than our critics, our critics, and He's good all the time. And He will use what the enemy uses against us, our, our critics use against us, every experience. Did you know that God never wastes an experience? He never does. He uses all things for good in my life. God has the habit of rubbing the, the devil's nose in the very thing that he imprisons people with because he uses all things for good. Okay. What about the next truth? Here's the next truth I want you to, to remember. Number three. God wants me to succeed. Now you heard it right. God wants me to succeed. Where do I get that idea from? Well, listen to this. <clears throat> Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question. Who can be against us? He wants you to succeed. Remember way back then we said that we belong to the family? Verse 14 of Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. We belong to the family of God. <clears throat> you are his son. You are his daughter. He wants you to succeed. It says over there, if God is for us, who can be against us? It says that He is for you. He's not against you. He wants you to succeed because He's, he's for you. And that's very important to remember. God is for you, not against you. Number four, the fourth truth you need to remember when bitterness starts to grab hold of your heart is verse 32 verse 32 of Romans and it says this he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him with Jesus also freely give us all things Truth number four is that God will give me what I need. In fact, God will give me whatever I need. God will give me what I need. What that tells us is that when you're feeling envious, when you're feeling bitter, remind yourself that God's Spirit is praying for you number one remind yourself that God is using everything for good in your life number three remind yourself that God wants you to succeed and number four remind yourself that God will give me whatever I need we need to remember those four truths my friends because bitterness comes to us when we look across the fence. The grass is always greener there. But God's word says, Don't worry, I'm praying for you. Don't worry, I use every experience you go through in life and turn them into good. I want you to succeed. And I will give you 
whatever you need in life. So my friends, it's very important for us to remember what I've just said. God's Spirit is praying for me. God is using everything for good in my life. God wants me to succeed. God will give me whatever I need. He's basically saying that if he went all the way, all the way with his son, his one and only son, if Jesus was crucified, if God can give up his son for you, that verse says, don't you think that he loves you enough to help you with your debt? Don't you think he cares enough for you to help you with your health? Don't you think that he loves you enough that he will help your marriage? You have a headache, he cares for that too. Sore, sore tummy? Of course he does. You see, there is absolutely nothing in your life that God does not care about. The Bible says that he cares about everything about you. Remember, you are a son. You are his daughter. He cares about everything. But hear this. Did you know that with God there is no such thing as big problems? He cares for you, but from his perspective to us, when we are running around with our huge problems, they are too simple for him. Extremely tiny to him so he's saying if if you went all the way to crucify his son because he loves and cares for you he cares about everything that you face in life so the biblical habit to replace bitterness I wrote this in a bulletin is to remember this my God is always good and in charge my god is always good and in charge there is no place the psalmist says you can go where god isn't yeah psalm 139 there is no place where i can go where your spirit isn't that's what the psalmist says god is always good and in charge he sees everything knows everything he knows your past, present, and what you're contemplating for the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever. He knows everything. So when bitterness knocks on the door, my friend, family of God, remind yourself, God is praying for me. I'm talking about God. He is God Almighty. He is praying for me. Almighty God is going to use everything for good in my life my God wants me to succeed and my Jehovah Chara my God supplies all of my needs regardless what comes my way my God is always good and in charge and therefore I need not worry about anything Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word this morning. We thank you that you are always good. You see all things and you are in charge. We thank you, Father, that you love us so, so much. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross to pay for all our sins so that that power of sin can be broken and since it's broken the door is wide open now for us jesus you said that if we abide in you and your words abide in us we can ask whatever we wish and we thank you for reminding us this morning that you are for us not against us reminding us this morning you want us to succeed in life 
that you would use all things for good in our lives, that you provide our needs. We thank you, Father God, for your loving goodness. We thank you for all your promises that are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. I now pray that may our souls, our hearts be like those good soil that will bear fruit to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.